Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. For the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about attachment and attachment styles and how they affect our adult lives and our adult relationships today. And last week, we talked about secure attachment, the kind of attachment that allows us to feel comfortable in our relationships, feeling safe, allowing ourselves to build trust. But today we're going to start our conversation about insecure attachment. Before I begin, I want to clarify that there are no bad attachment styles. The purpose of this podcast isn't to say that insecure attachment is bad and secure attachment is good, but rather my hope is to help you understand why you might not feel safe in some or all of your relationships, why you behave the way you do in your relationships, and to help you decide if your way of relating is meeting your needs or not. The last thing I want people to take away from our conversation on attachment is that they're somehow doing something wrong or that they should be different than they are. My goal is to help you understand yourself better so you can begin to recognize your needs and get them met. The most crazy making part about attachment happens when we want something different, but we don't know how to get it or why it doesn't come easily to us like it seems to come easily to some other people. It's especially difficult if we've learned to judge ourselves for our behaviors instead of get curious about what our behaviors are letting us know about our experience. If you take nothing else away from these episodes, I hope you'll take away an understanding for why you relate to others the way you do, and a sense of empowerment about what to do with that information and get the relationship results that feel best for you. As we talked about in past episodes, there are four attachment styles. We talked about secure attachment last week, and this week we're going to cover anxious attachment. I almost didn't create a podcast solely for anxious attachment because it's so closely related with codependency and enmeshment which I've talked about several times in the past. Just for clarification, codependency is when one person takes on the role of caregiver to another at the expense of their own needs. They get their sense of purpose, acceptance, and worthiness from their role of feeling needed. And enmeshment, on the other hand, is lacking boundaries so that you almost feel like you are the other person. When they're sad, you're sad. When they are rejected, you feel rejected. This can happen when a parent lives vicariously through their child too, pouring all of their time and attention into a child and then taking credit for that child's accomplishments and successes as their own, or feeling bad about their failures or somehow personally responsible when their child doesn't succeed. So while anxious attachment is highly correlated with both codependency and enmeshment, I think that because it happens on a spectrum and it has some of its own traits, it warrants talking about on its own. You may find that you're towards one end of the spectrum, enjoying secure attachments with many people that are only twinged on the edges with some anxiety about your relationship and need for validation, while people further on the other end of the spectrum maybe spend quite a bit of time and energy worried about the status of their relationships fearful about abandonment, and anxiously reading cues and caretaking others' needs, hoping they won't be discarded, which is more likely to be in the enmeshed and codependent territory. Now, in this episode, we talk about the benefits of seeking support from other adults as we heal from childhood attachment wounds. I would love to have you join us for our live weekly support call on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. We do that every single week. 
To be included in the call, go to my website at www.emancipateyourmind.org and click on the box that says support the podcast and give a gift. Make any size of monthly donation, then email me at terry at emancipatedcoaching.com to be added to the list this week for our discussion on anxious attachment and a further discussion on how to heal these patterns. You'll also receive an email on Monday with preparation questions for the call and additional tools to help you get the most from today's episode. So if that is something that sounds like it would be really supportive for you, or if at the end of this episode, you think to yourself, oh, I think this is my attachment style, please go over there and click that button to make that donation so that you can join our call this upcoming Wednesday. All right, so what is anxious or anxious preoccupied attachment? This is the first style of insecure attachment that we're going to talk about. Anxious attachment is how we describe the attachment style of those who deeply desire to be close with others, but they worry that others don't want to be with them. They usually have a deep fear of rejection or abandonment, and because of this, they often need frequent or even constant validation and reassurance that everything is okay in the relationship and that the other person is okay with them. That, you know, they like them. They think they're a good person. They're constantly checking in to make sure, am I okay? And are we okay? The narrative they usually have about themselves in relationships is I'm too much. And this is often because they've been told by others that they're too clingy and they're too emotionally needy. In previous episodes, Kevin has talked about pursuers and withdrawers in relationships, especially during conflict. And for those of you who haven't listened to the episodes with Kevin, Kevin is my husband. He's a licensed professional counselor here in Colorado, and he also does religious trauma coaching out of state. So if you're looking for a religious trauma coach, if you're wanting a male as a coach, if you're wanting a religious trauma coach who has a background in couples therapy, Kevin is taking clients right now. And his focus, really his genius, is in relationships and helping people understand one another in relationships. And he comes from an attachment background. So his emphasis is emotionally focused therapy, which is based on the theory of attachment. And so he has talked about this idea that there are pursuers and there are withdrawers in relationships. And it's usually the anxiously attached partner in the relationship that will be the pursuer. The one that has a hard time tolerating any sense of physical separation or emotional disconnection during conflict, even for the purpose of cooling down and thinking more clearly. This is going to be the person who will often check in a million times before doing any personal processing or emotional regulation themselves. They're going to ask again and again, are we okay? Are we okay? Are we okay? And they're going to be the ones that sit outside the door of a room the other partner has gone into for emotional regulation, try and get the other person to come out and talk it out before either of them is truly clear about their triggers, their resulting emotions, or what they'd like to see happen moving forward. So we'll talk more about this in an episode about relationships between the different attachment styles because it's too much for this episode, but just know that there's a reason that pursuers and withdrawers are often in relationships together and it has everything to do with attachment styles. In fact, that's the whole reason we're talking about attachment is we've been working on a secure attachment with ourselves since January. That's what all of the podcasts have been. They've been about getting in touch with ourselves, our needs, our emotions, learning how to care for those things so that now we can show up in relationship with others in a way that is healthy and that actually meets our needs because that's the most frustrating thing, right? We want to have these connections. We want to get our needs met. But sometimes when we have these patterns, sometimes we attract other people who have different patterns because it's what we're used to, it's what feels familiar, but we continue the patterns that were started in our childhood that don't meet our needs. And so we end up feeling lonely and misunderstood or disconnected. And the biggest thing I've heard from you, at least last year, 
the biggest comment or the most amount of comments that I got said, I just want deep connected relationships. I want community. I want meaningful friendships. I want to make sure I'm parenting my children in a healthy way. I want to have lasting, healthy relationships with my kids. I want to make sure that my spouse and I are operating in a healthier way. So this is where we're headed. And the reason that we're talking about attachment, because often we are coming into our relationships with these subconscious patterns, and sometimes we're not aware of why we behave the way we do and why other people behave the way they do. And it can create some some conflict. It can create some friction and some misunderstandings and some unmet expectations. And so my hope is that by really understanding what these different attachment styles are, first of all, we'll be able to understand ourselves better. But second of all, we'll be able to understand other people's behavior better as well, because the way they show up in relationship is going to tell us a lot about them and their needs and their childhood patterns as well. And it's going to allow us to have empathy and also to start conversations that will help us make those subconscious patterns more conscious where we can get curious and we can problem solve together and find win-win situations for us both so that both of us can get our needs met. And when we're in relationship, even if You come into a relationship. So I came into a relationship with more of a disorganized attachment. Sometimes I was anxious. Sometimes I would withdraw just kind of depending on what was happening. And Kevin came into the relationship with more of an avoidant attachment. And so even though we came into our relationship with an insecure attachment, because we've had almost, well, over two decades now of conversations about our needs why we do what we do, what's going on. There has been a lot of curiosity, a lot of like deep heart-to-heart talks and a lot of practice. We have tried things on and failed, tweaked what we've been doing, tried things on again, and we've continued to perfect this to the point now where both of us feel like we can just ask for what we need and we understand one another much better. We have grown into secure attachment with one another because we were able to have conversations about our insecure attachment and it felt safe. And it felt like it was okay that we had some of the wounds and the insecurities and the fears and the needs that we had. And so I learned to give Kevin space so that he could process and feel safe. I learned to slow things down. I learned to sit with my difficult emotions. And Kevin learned to circle back and to come back and like, well, first of all, to let me know, I just need some space. I'm going to calm down for a minute, but I'm going to come back and we're going to have this conversation. We will resolve this conflict. So I needed that before he went and took his space. So he learned to do that with me. And then he would come back which built trust. And we would sometimes have to do that several times in a conflict where we would both get triggered and he would say, I'm going to go cool down. Don't worry, I'm coming back. And he would go to a room and take, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes even an hour if it was a really heated conversation. And then he'd come back and we would converse some more. Sometimes we'd sleep on it and then we'd converse some more and we'd kind of like take the time that we needed. But because he would let me know, I'm not abandoning you. I'm just going and caring for myself and I will come back so that we can reconnect. I love you. I'm coming back. I began to build trust and I began to feel less anxious and he began to feel less threatened too because I was less emotional. So because the two of us worked together, I was willing to give him space. He was willing to give me reassurance. We actually got to a place now where I can give myself reassurance. I learned how to do that for myself. And he actually feels comfortable sitting with difficult emotions, even when things can get heated sometimes. And he doesn't feel like he needs to escape for safety. So just know that if you're in a relationship with someone you really, really love 
and both of you have insecure attachment, that understanding what both of your styles are might give you some hints about what you both need so that you can start conversations with one another to get both of your needs met. And as you practice meeting both of your needs and soothing these parts of your insecure attachment, what's going to end up happening is you're going to feel safer with one another. You're going to trust one another more. And it's going to lead to a more secure attachment. That is my hope for all of us. Now, what are some common signs that you have an anxious attachment style? Now, the very first sign is that you put other people's needs first at the expense of your own. You likely consider yourself a people pleaser. You're the little caretaker. You go around and you do things for people all of the time. Underneath all of it, there is this desire to make yourself sort of indispensable. You know, you want people to know how likable and lovable and how much service you provide them so that they'll never, ever, ever reject you or abandon you. You want to make yourself someone that people can't live without. But often you do this at the expense of yourself. So you probably have some resentment going on. There's probably things that you do for others that people don't appreciate well enough. Or sometimes you might feel like you get taken advantage of. Um, Sometimes you get asked to do things you don't really want to do, but you feel obligated to do them because they've relied on you in the past. So sometimes you feel a little bit trapped or resentful, or it feels like you're the only one doing anything because deep underneath this, you're doing these behaviors, hoping to get your needs met. And if you're just giving and giving and giving, but you're not getting in return, it really can feel exhausting, lonely, and you can start to feel resentful and angry. The second sign is that you need frequent validation from others. You worry how others perceive you because their perception determines your perception of yourself in the moment. You rely on other people to tell you whether you're good. You rely on other people's evaluations to tell you whether you can be at peace. You need other people to tell you that you're worthy and that you're lovable. And they do this both with their words and with their actions. And so when it feels like you're detached from people, when it feels like you're maybe a little bit disconnected, when you haven't heard from people in a while, or when people don't, you know, praise you as much as you thought they would over whatever it is that you did for them, you can start to read into that and maybe think to yourself that you're not good enough or that people don't really like you, it can really work on your self-worth and your self-esteem and kind of make it difficult to keep up a high sense of self-worth and self-esteem because you're, you're constantly reading other people to make sure that they love you and appreciate you and see you. The third sign is you feel intense emotional discomfort when you're alone and you avoid it if possible. So being with people kind of calms that inner anxiety in you, especially when you're with a person that you're deeply attached to. So if you're with your, you know, loved one, your mother, your sister, your best friend, it helps you feel more secure. It helps you feel like you have an anchor. So if you really struggle being alone, if being alone feels scary or overwhelming, it could be a sign that you have anxious attachment style. The fourth sign is you struggle to set boundaries. You're constantly trying to get that validation from other people. So you kind of put yourself to the side and let people kind of take whatever they want to take as long as it keeps them happy and attached to you. Number five is deep down, you fear being rejected or abandoned. In fact, this is the primary fear for people with anxious attachment style. They're afraid If they don't please the people in their life, the people in their life will reject them and abandon them. And that feels absolutely terrifying. Number six is sometimes you wonder if you're worthy of being loved as you are because you're trying so hard to please the people in your life. And because of things that happened in your childhood, it never felt like you were allowed to just be you. So 
You had to perform service for other people. You had to caretake other people. You had to be hyper vigilant. You had to people please. You had to make your mom or your dad or your family look good. All of that responsibility was on your shoulders, but it left you wondering if you could just be loved being the human version of you, not the super people pleaser perfectionist version of you. Number seven, you have an intense desire for intimacy or closeness with others, but you worry that others don't love you or want you as much as you love and want them. And this makes it difficult for you to fully trust other people. Number eight, you're deeply sensitive to even the small changes in the ways people feel, speak, or behave. You're often looking for people's emotional and physical needs before they may even be aware of them. In the psychology world, we call this hypervigilance because you're like hyper aware of all of these little nuances. And yes, it does make us very aware of other people's needs. And it is kind of a superpower because we notice things for people before they may even notice them themselves. So people in like the helping field, so doctors and therapists and coaches, People who have this skill, um, they're going to notice when somebody's eye twitches. They're going to notice when someone like grimaces really quickly. They're going to notice when someone goes rigid. And that's because you became very, very hyper vigilant with your caregivers to see what their moods were so that you could get your needs met. Because if you could keep mom happy, she might be more likely to meet your needs than if mom got emotionally dysregulated. And so, you learned to like pick up on that heavier breathing that meant that she was getting distressed or those heavier footfalls on the pavement that let you know mom's stress level is picking up and I need to kick in. I need to do something to diminish her stress so that she doesn't check out for a bit and become kind of unaware or unavailable for a while. So because things were unpredictable, you learned to be hyper aware of the people around you. Now, some people call this empathy. I do not call this empathy. I think this is just hyper awareness because empathy is not only noticing that someone is distressed, but also then being able to get curious with them, to be able to get vulnerable with them and to figure out what that experience is like for them. And then connecting to something inside of ourselves that can kind of understand that. What often happens when we're anxiously attached is we're hyper aware and then we project what we would feel in that situation or what our caregiver growing up would have done or felt. So we project what happened in our past on someone in the present or we project something inside of us onto the person in front of us. It can lead to some misunderstandings, but it also can be a really great benefit We can notice those things, but we do have to be careful that we don't then project a story onto them based on our past or based on like our own expectations or our own experiences. And then number nine, you may have a tendency to feel or act jealous if it feels like someone else is getting close with the people you love. So if your best friend makes a new friend at dance class or, you know, in the gardening club or at a mom's group, and tells you about it, you may feel an intense stab of jealousy. I know that sometimes in my family, I've had certain family members as we've been going to therapy and healing that have talked about like the intense stab of jealousy when one of us got married or when we started to have kids and our time and attention was being divided among other people. And so there were some really intense feelings of jealousy And some behaviors that are called protest behaviors, basically what we do is we test other people to see if they really love and care about us. We might try to make them jealous or we might like do other things. All right. So how did we get here? Like many of the things we talk about here on this podcast, it really does start with our childhood. That can especially be uncomfortable for those of us who come from like anxious attachment type backgrounds because our parents sometimes were wonderful. It was really confusing because sometimes they were totally present and they were super fun and, 
you know, they would laugh really hard and they would just be the life of the party and they could be really invested in what we're interested in. And they could be really attuned to our needs and just wonderful, wonderful parents. And it could change in a moment when our parents were triggered where they could ignore our needs or not like even understand we had needs or read our needs wrong, depending on their own like mood, their own emotional stability, um, and even their own like depressive episodes or what was happening at church or with their own attachment with their parents or family. So it can be really difficult because on the one hand, those of us with anxious attachment often have some really great memories of our parents and they met most of our physical needs. And on the other hand, it was really unpredictable whether they were going to recognize our emotional needs and meet them. Sometimes they would, and they could be really caring and really empathic, and sometimes they wouldn't. Now, that's the biggest thing, the biggest predictor for anxious attachment style is really inconsistent parenting. And because the parent is sometimes very attuned to the child's emotional and physical needs and other times inexplicably, at least from the child's perspective, right? They're sometimes emotionally unavailable and or misattuned. This leads a child to feel fearful or anxious that their needs will be interpreted correctly and met in a prompt and reliable way. They find it hard to trust that others will meet their needs appropriately. Now, I want to talk quickly about inconsistent attunement. What is attunement? So anxious attachment can often happen when parents are different than their children. This especially happens with differences in neuroprocessing styles between parent and child. So if you have a neurotypical parent raising a neurodivergent child, for instance, especially if you are my age or older. So if you're in your 40s or older, we really did not understand spectrum disorders. We didn't understand ADHD very well. And the parenting books of the time, like if your parents were like, okay, I want to do a really good job raising my kids, the parenting books at the time were all about making children fit the norms. So it was really difficult if you had a neurotypical parent and you were neurodivergent They may have noticed that you had needs or that you were emotionally dysregulated, but they may have misinterpreted those needs or have been taught to do something different than what you needed. And the same can be true if you had different temperaments or ways of giving and receiving affection, like different love languages. So if you have a parent that's all about physical touch and you need words of affirmation, Your parent may be telling you all day long, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you by, you know, braiding your hair and, you know, giving you hugs or just, you know, snuggling you. And what you really need to hear is, I think you're so smart. I love, you know, the way that you thought about that book. You made me think about some new things and I love the way you see the world and You know, they needed that affirmation that they're seen and that they're known and that their parent like sees them as an individual. But those are two completely different love languages. And that can lead to some misattunement. Now, specific to this podcast about, you know, high demand religion, this also happens in deeply religious households when parents are mistakenly taught that emotional dysregulation or even any show of big emotion in their children is a sign of a fallen nature instead of a legitimate need that needs patient attention, empathy, and support from the parent. So if your parents were taught that your two-year-old temper tantrum was the devil and they were told that spanking you would spank the devil out, you're going to have some misattunement because you're emotionally dysregulated. You've got big emotions. You don't have the tools yet to understand what your emotions are, what they're called, and what to do with them. And no one's modeling that for you. Instead, they're spanking you. They're hitting you. They're hurting you. And that can lead to some serious anxiety. 
I have a big overwhelming emotion as a two-year-old. I don't have the words to explain it. It's huge. It's uncomfortable. I don't know what to do with it. And the adult in my life, instead of helping me work through this big emotion, they hit me instead, which was really common when I was growing up. When I was going to school, you know, in small town Texas, I mean, the principal was still spanking kids at school. In fact, I can still remember my mother talking with her other mom friends whenever I was a kid about other parents who didn't spank their children and how they were raising their kids to be soft and raising their kids to be undisciplined and um, to be like bad kids, basically, that that was bad parenting. And so if you're my age, our parents were being taught that spanking was the way to raise a disciplined child that not spanking was actually doing your child a disservice. And really what was happening, as we know now from the, you know, 40 years of research that was starting to come out whenever I was an elementary school kid and really ramped up throughout the 90s, what we know now is that spanking is actually really damaging for children. And because of this misattunement, it creates attachment anxiety. It creates a sense of my needs are going to be misunderstood. They're not going to be met. And even worse with spanking, they're going to be punished. I'm going to be hit. I'm going to be hurt for having needs. So in religious households, there's misattunement because some of the doctrine teaches parents that kids' behaviors mean a certain thing when actually they don't. They mean something else. And there's a response that we could give that would actually be much more attuned and much more empathic and much more helpful. Now, the other inconsistency happens when our parents are sometimes emotionally available and other times they're not. And different examples of how this might show up is first, like a parent that has an addiction or a mental illness. I think what's most commonly used in the examples is they'll often talk about like alcoholism or something like that. But If you had a parent with an addiction or a mental illness, they may have been present when they were emotionally stable or sober, but unavailable when they were in a depressive episode or intoxicated. So you may have learned to tune into their subtle cues when they came home or throughout the day to try to decipher which parent you were dealing with. Were you dealing with the available one, the nice one, the friendly one, the empathic one, the kind one, or are you dealing with the unavailable one? the one that's sad and wrapped up in themselves, the one that, you know, in the movie, because of Winn-Dixie, she talks about her dad, her preacher father, being like a turtle in his shell with his head just like tucked into his shell. Sometimes our parents would be like that, right? Wrapped up in their own depression, their own problems, their own sense of not enoughness their sadness, their grief, and, you know, or sometimes they may have drank those problems away or done something else, you know, distracted themselves in order to deal with that emotional pain. So if you had a parent that was sometimes present, but sometimes not present, this can also happen if you had a parent that was chronically ill. So if you had a parent that had good days where they were healthy, Like if you had a parent who had cancer or some sort of autoimmune illness on the days when they were healthy, if they were able to connect with you, but on the days when they weren't healthy, they were distant or drugged or hospitalized. This, this may have led to some anxious attachment because you had this inconsistency, even if your parent would have chosen something different, like they would not have chosen to be hospitalized intermittently throughout your, throughout your childhood. Second, trauma. So when our parents have unresolved trauma, they often have unregulated nervous systems. That's what trauma does to us. Trauma puts our nervous system in fight or flight consistently. And when we're stuck in that fight or flight place, then all of our nervous systems are just like on high alert. Now, one of two things happens. In the short term, when our nervous system is turned on high alert, we're more aware of everything all the time. 
when we have generational trauma or any kind of trauma and our nervous systems are turned up, then everything feels bigger. Like everything feels like it could be the end of the world. And we're hyper vigilant all the time. And so the slightest little thing can set us off and can trigger us. Now, that might have been your parent. Your parent may have had a hairline trigger, right? They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. They're at least like functioning, right? They might be like high stress or whatever. They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. And then boom, they're not fine. The other thing that can happen is our brains are adaptable and they're meant to help us survive. And because all of this information all at once, all the time, being hyper vigilant all the time is so overwhelming to us and so exhausting. Sometimes what our brains do instead is they actually numb the awareness. They dial things down so that we almost kind of feel numb all the time. And so your parent, if they got to that point where they were kind of numb and cold and unresponsive, it led to more of an avoidant style. And we will talk about that in the next episode. But just understand that trauma really does play a huge part in the way our parents parented us and the attachment styles that we created with them as a result. Now, for those of us who had parents raised in high demand religion, our parents may have experienced enough childhood adverse experiences either at church or in their homes, that they have some CPTSD symptoms. And because high demand religion seems to go hand in hand with narcissistic abuse, your parents may have had trauma from both an abusive religious system and an abusive family system. It is very possible that your parents had CPTSD, which, you know, is is something that we're only just starting to learn about and their parenting with this persistent trauma, this persistent unknown trauma. Because up until very recently, most people with CPTSD would have said, oh, I don't have trauma. I wasn't, you know, in a car accident. I wasn't in a war zone. I wasn't assaulted. And so therefore I don't have trauma. But we know now that little microaggressions over time, like consistent gaslighting, consistent manipulation, consistent put downs can lead to long-term trauma. Consistent anxiety and fear can lead to trauma. The next thing that might've led to our parents' inconsistent emotional availability is their lack of emotional intelligence. Now, when I say lack of emotional intelligence, this has happened a couple of times. People are like, oh my gosh, that's so rude because they're thinking of it like I'm saying that they're, they're dumb or something. And that is not at all what I'm saying. Just like we have to learn information, right? We have to learn about the world. We have to learn how it works. The same is true for emotional intelligence. It's not something we're born with. We're born with emotions, but we're not necessarily born with the tools to work through our emotions. Those have to be taught to us, just like we have to learn history and geography. We have to learn math. We have to learn how things work. So emotional intelligence, all it is, is it's basically the box of tools that we use to recognize that we're having emotions, label our emotions, know what our emotions are saying to us and what they want us to do. Like, what is that energy calling us to do? It is a sense of responsibility for our own emotional selves and the ability to like, maturely work with our emotions. So it's something we can learn. Our parents, many of them were not given the tools of emotional intelligence, especially if they were in high demand religion, because people are much easier to control when they're out of touch with their own inner knowing. And so a lot of high demand systems, a lot of high demand religions actually do things that detach you from your own inner wisdom. They forbid certain emotions. They forbid certain thoughts. They police, you know, certain information. So there's a lot of things like psychology, going to a therapist for a long time was really looked down on in Mormonism. And I know it still is in several other high demand religions. You were just told that if you were following Jesus well enough, you wouldn't need to go to a therapist. So you were kind of barred 
from getting the tools you needed to be emotionally intelligent. Now, in order to be attuned to your child's needs, it requires a certain amount of these tools. You have to be able to recognize emotion. You have to be able to accurately label it. And you have to be able to connect with something inside of yourself that knows that feeling. But if you're separated from that, you can't consistently recognize your own emotions and care for them. It makes it really difficult to accurately and appropriately respond to the emotional needs of your children. Now, here's a quick note. Sometimes when a parent is particularly estranged from their own emotional needs, what ends up happening is they unconsciously burden their children with the task of regulating their feelings and moods. They may also put this burden on like their spouse and like their best friends and stuff like that too. They do this to everyone. They don't know how to recognize their own feelings. They don't know what to do if they do recognize a feeling. And so because they don't know what to do, they look to other people, even tiny people in their life, to regulate their emotions for them. These parents may task their children with making them feel better when they're stressed or overwhelmed or anxious or with making them feel loved and needed, basically giving them the validation that the parent didn't get in childhood. And some parents have kids because they want to feel needed. And they have a really difficult time as their child starts to grow up and have their own emotions and their own thoughts because the whole purpose of having the child was to feel needed. And it felt so good when this child was an infant because they needed the parent for everything. And when you've grown up with anxious attachment, having a human that needs you for everything feels so good and so secure. But then that tiny human starts walking, they start talking, they start saying no and throwing their toys and asserting their independence. And then they grow up a little bit more and then they become teenagers and then they leave your house and it is super difficult for an anxiously attached parent. So when this happens, the child learns that their emotional needs are secondary to the parent's needs and they become hypervigilant to the needs of their parents so that their own needs will hopefully get met. This can lead a child to be anxious or clingy around the parent, or a child may feel like they need to overexpress their needs. So if a kid gets hurt and they're anxiously attached, they might not just cry, but they might wail when they're hurt because that's going to be more likely to get their parents' attention and hopefully their like response to get their scraped knee cleaned and fixed or the love and comfort that they're desperately needing. This can also happen when they're feeling sick. They might not just show that they're a little sick. They might like really make a production of it and act really sick so that their parent will take notice that they're sick and get the care that they need. The fourth thing that can happen that can make parents inconsistently emotionally available is distraction. When parents are often, but again, inconsistently, that inconsistency is the big piece here. So when parents are often, but inconsistently too distracted for their child, it can lead to anxious attachment as well. So this can be related to the addictive behaviors we talked about that numb uncomfortable emotions, but it can also be other addictive things like being busy with work or with church or with screens to help you escape difficult feelings, or like with screens to help them escape difficult feelings that they don't recognize. Or in highly religious families, this sometimes happens when there are so many children that the parents are often distracted with other siblings, and they aren't able to give each child consistent emotional availability and attunement. And again, I want to make the point that I know there are some of you listening because If this is your style, you probably are a recovering people pleaser and you want your kids to think really well of you. It really kind of kills you that your kids might have any issues with you at all when they grow up. And I feel that deeply and I empathize with that deeply. And I want you to know that you don't have to be perfect. You're probably also a recovering perfectionist. There's a piece of you that feels like you have to be the perfect parent. You have to be perfectly securely attached. 
that you have to have all of your trauma perfectly healed in order for your kids to have a good childhood. Because underneath that is this like fear, again, of rejection and abandonment. You're so worried that your kids will have some sort of complaint against you, that they will have endured some sort of harm, that you will have accidentally passed on some kind of generational trauma or religious trauma to them, and that then they'll hate you and abandon you and never want to be with you ever again. I get that. And I want you to know that you don't have to be a perfect parent in order to have healthy relationships with your kids. Your kids didn't deserve a perfect parent because there's no such thing. Your kids deserve a healthy parent, not a perfect parent, a healthy parent. Whether you were able to do that before they were born, as they were maturing in your home, or even now if they're adults, you can decide to take care of yourself, your childhood wounds, and learn to care for your own emotional needs so that you can begin to relate in more secure ways with your children, no matter their age now. Remember, our kids don't want perfect parents. They want parents who are accountable, who can validate their experience who can empathize, and who are willing to grow forward with them. That's what our kids want. And the good news is, is that the attachment research has shown that it isn't what happened to us as children that predicts what kind of parent we'll be, but how much we've allowed ourselves to explore the pain we may have experienced in our childhood and given ourselves the time and permission to make sense of that. That's what predicts our parenting. And again, that can happen either before our kids come while our kids are in the house, or even after they've become adults. The more we're willing to look at things and process things and get curious with things and work through things, the more secure our attachments can be. Now, a quick note, please don't turn to your kids for therapy. The idea of caring for your own emotional needs may feel really frightening and lonely if you were raised with anxious attachment. And I'm not suggesting that you have to do all this healing and sorting through your emotions on your own. You're allowed to get support from others. However, whether you have young children, teens, or adult children, please find some adults you can rely on that are not your kids to process and make sense of your feelings and help you sort through what happened in your childhood. If you relied on your kids when they were young to help you emotionally regulate, it still wouldn't be fair to rely on them to help you process your feelings now that they're adults, at least while you're both healing your anxious attachment, because caring for your emotional needs may be part of their childhood wounds. Instead, find a therapist, find a support group, or a good friend who has both healthy boundaries and the ability to empathize to help you explore your feelings and figure out what they mean and what you want and to create a plan to care for your needs. This doesn't mean you can't communicate with your kids afterwards. You can let them know after you've processed. You can let them know like, hey, I realized, you know, this was my attachment wound. I was doing these different things. This is how I'm caring for myself. And I think that may have affected you. And then you open up the door to say, did that affect you? Did you notice that in our relationship? So you bring your sorted emotional stuff and say, this is what I've learned about myself, how I've cared for myself. Did that affect you at all? Because my guess is it did. And I want to hear about it. And I'd love to explore that with you and, and heal that with you if you're open to that. Again, if you have anxious attachment, there's going to be a part of you that wants to like force closer attachment if your kids have pulled away because the attachment wounds have been really sticky or dicey. And that is going to actually make the wound worse. So we heal ourselves, we find other adults who can support us, and then we invite kids who have had insecure attachment with us into conversation when they feel safe and when they feel ready. But we don't force and we don't like chase after them and pursue them. We let them come to us as they feel safer. All right. So let's talk about how we start to heal from this. The very first thing we're going to do is we start with us. We build secure attachment with ourselves. Often when we've been raised with anxious attachment, codependency or enmeshment, we were taught to value ourselves in relation to others. 
We struggle with boundaries, self-worth, and fear of abandonment because our sense of self is tangled up with other people's moods, needs, and desires. We developed a pattern of hoping that if we took care of people we loved really well, that they would somehow show up for us and take care of us. Sometimes this happened, and sometimes it didn't, even though we really needed the support. Instead, begin to turn your energy towards recognizing your own emotions, needs, and desires, and learning to interpret and meet those needs for yourself. If you struggle to know what you want or need, allow yourself to get curious for as long as it takes. Why do you feel the way you do? Does that emotion have a name? What does it want from you? Then try something on and see how it fits or doesn't fit. Then assess, did it meet your need or did it not? Then you can rework your plan and try again. This is how an attuned parent meets the needs of their infant or preverbal child. They notice the child has a need. They do their best to interpret the need. And then they try on solutions to see how the child responds to each. What does the child seem to like and dislike? You'll be doing this with yourself. Just be aware, which will take some mindfulness, tuning into yourself regularly, and then get curious about what it might mean and what might help you feel better. Then after that, get curious about your response to whatever you decided to do. This also works if you have an emotionally dysregulated moment or a burst of insecurity. Just get curious. Everything that happens with us emotionally is just information from our inner knowing. So if you have a freak out moment or if you feel really jealous or insecure, get curious. What triggered it? What happened right before you noticed those feelings? And what can you do to help that part of yourself feel comforted? The next thing you can do is learn to tolerate the discomfort of big feelings or uncomfortable thoughts. One of the prices we all pay to have relationships with one another are the big, messy, uncomfortable feelings. Sometimes these feelings are huge things like anger or disappointment, but other times they're big feelings like joy and love. Those can be overwhelming and scary when we haven't also been taught how to tolerate emotions that go hand in hand with these. Grief and hurt, for instance, are the accompanying emotions for love. You can't love someone fully and openly without also opening yourself up to being hurt or experiencing grief at some point. Even if it's the grief of death after a long and happy life together. When we sign up for love, we also sign up for grief and for loss. If you can't trust yourself to experience and handle the grief or hurt, you're going to struggle to allow yourself to feel the love. When we aren't comfortable with difficult feelings or thoughts, when we try to experience love, but we don't trust ourselves to handle the inevitable grief that will come with love, we become anxious to always stay in the good feelings, trying to please and protect those around us so that we'll never experience loss. Learning to handle the discomfort of our big feelings allows us to build self-trust, which allows us to relax into our relationships. We don't know what the future will hold, but we know we'll have our backs no matter what happens, no matter how uncomfortable or even painful our experiences may be. We don't need our loved one to save us. We'll learn how to save ourselves. This is really important too because this is going to help you calm your nervous system when you're in conflict, which is usually when anxious attachment really rears up. When we feel disconnected, when we feel like someone's displeased with us, when we feel like someone's angry, it can be really uncomfortable because of that fear of rejection and abandonment. And remember, you can communicate about this, which is actually the next thing we can do to heal. A lot of times what we do is we resort to lots of passive aggressive type things when we're in an anxious attachment style. We will test our partners. We will make passive aggressive comments. We'll accuse our partners of things, but we won't have just like a clear conversation. So make it a goal to have clarification conversations. After you've sat with yourself 
recognized any fear or insecurity or something that's happening inside of yourself, gotten curious with those feelings, figured out what triggered them and what you want to see happen, then you're going to have a clarification conversation with the person you love and care about. So secure attachment with another person will involve sharing who you really are, what you really think, and how you really feel with others. Being emotionally regulated in a healthy relationship doesn't mean you keep all of your emotions to yourself. It means you take responsibility for your emotions and you don't expect someone else to understand them for you or regulate them for you. But it doesn't mean that you don't share. You're looking for support from them, not ownership from them. So you don't come with this mess and say, what is this and what do I do with it? You take some time to figure out what the mess is what you're anxious or worried about. And then we come to the conversation and we say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. This is why I'm feeling it. And I want to check in with you. Now, when we're anxiously attached, we often feel triggered by small changes in people's tone of voice, their facial expressions, their word choice, or their behavior. And we often really take a lot of pride in ourselves in being able to read a room. And while we are very accurate at seeing that small eye twitch or change in posture, we don't always interpret it correctly. Once we know what we're feeling and why we're feeling it, check in with the other person to see if our read on the situation was accurate. So for example, you might say to your best friend, like, it took you three days to answer my text. And I began to wonder if it was because I did something to upset you. Is that what happened? And then leave room to really hear their answer. Really get curious. Maybe they lost their phone. Maybe they were really sick and didn't check their phone for days. Maybe they saw the message while they were busy and they forgot to answer once things settled down. It happens all the time. But maybe they are upset and they're withdrawing to protect themselves. That's what this conversation is about. It's giving them a chance to clarify how they're feeling and what they experience. And then you problem solve together if needed about how to avoid misunderstandings in the future if that's what happened or how you can meet both your needs for safety and security in the relationship. It's it's awesome. So these kind of conversations are going to be what help you build the secure attachment. And I think I'm going to talk about these other two because we've been going for a while. I'm going to talk about these when we talk about relationships between the different styles. But this has been a really eye-opening conversation for me. I've learned more about anxious attachment. I hope you have too. And as you're exploring this, if you don't resonate with the anxious attachment style, because you might not, this might be you part of the time, but part of the time you shut people out. Maybe you have a push and pull, or maybe you're a person that just really doesn't like connecting deeply with people. It freaks you out a little bit. You kind of like being on your own because it feels like less drama or you like having lots of emotional space around you or even physical space. All of that is good information. And my guess is if you are an avoidant attachment style, somebody who likes lots of space and really doesn't want people to get super, super close to you, you probably have anxiously attached people in your life that probably drive you fairly nuts. It might even be your significant other. And my guess is if you have anxious and avoidant attachment styles um, from your childhood, that part of this helped you understand like half of yourself better. At least I hope that's what came across. This week, please set a time each day to think about these things, to write about what you notice in your attachment with others. Some of my clients have found it even helpful to draw or paint or even exercise while they're doing the thinking. What does your inner wisdom want you to know about your attachment? And like, notice if certain people come to mind and then get curious with it. What common fears or anxieties come out when you interact with this person? What triggers those fears? How do you respond to those fears? Like, what's your normal response? Just allow yourself to get curious and then decide what you could do to meet your needs and help soothe yourself this week and try something on. I know this work can be challenging. Believe me, two decades of doing this work now, 
And it is so worth it. The relationships, those secure attachments, those feelings of safety are so worth it. That's my wish for all of us. Thank you for tuning in this Sunday, and I will see you next Sunday.